today I'm going to be talking about peripheral tolerance. And one thing that I hope you will see in our discussion of peripheral tolerance and that I hope that you will appreciate is the way that some of our more clinical topics are going to really tie together things you've already learned. Um, so you will see, I hope, a bunch of things we talk about today that are going to uh, look kind of familiar. And so that will be perhaps a comforting thing to see. Um, in thinking about uh, tolerance, we are really thinking about the way we avoid making responses to self antigens. So this came up in another particular, another class. Um, autoimmunity is really a situation where you are making a response to self antigens. Um, that is different from immunodeficiency where you are missing an immune response. It's also a bit different than um, what immunologists call hypersensitivity, which is where you're making a response against something that's foreign but harmless like me and pollen. Um, both today and Wednesday, we're going to be talking about autoimmunity and peripheral tolerance. We'll talk about um, hypersensitivity. Um, maybe if we have time on Wednesday, otherwise it will be um, starting on Friday. Um, and so you'll see each of these definitions specifically um, as we get to the individual topics. But just so you are aware, we are currently talking about autoimmunity, and that is specifically a response against a self-antigen. And autoimmunity largely results from some kind of failure in tolerance. So something goes wrong with a tolerance mechanism. So if we're going to understand autoimmunity, which is largely kind of an area that we're going to be talking about on Wednesday, we need to figure out what are these mechanisms of tolerance that could fail. We've already seen some tolerance mechanisms earlier this semester. So when immunologists divide up the tolerance mechanisms, sometimes one of the ways we'll divide them up is into central tolerance versus peripheral tolerance. Spoiler alert. We're mostly going to talk about peripheral tolerance today. Um, but we should think a little bit about central tolerance. And when we think about central tolerance, we want to think a little bit about where there are issues. Why is it that the central tolerance mechanisms that we talk about are enough to totally protect us from autoimmunity? Where are the holes in the plan? So we've already seen B cell central tolerance earlier this semester. What do you recall about B cell central tolerance? Remember, tolerance is how we make sure we don't have self-reactive cells, self-reactive lymphocytes. Yep, Carney. Uh, what is the wave with energy? Okay. So remember, so the B cells could undergo energy. When we think about central tolerance, where anatomically are we talking? Ermi. The bone marrow. The bone marrow or wherever our cells are developing. So in the case of B cells, it's the bone marrow. Um, so we saw some B cells sometimes uh, being induced to energy in the bone marrow. That was one of our options for B cell central tolerance. What were our other options for B cell central tolerance? Michael? Uh, deletion. deletion. So our uh, self reactive B cell could have been deleted. Um, and then we had one other option. Yeah, Michael? Receptor, Receptor editing. editing. Perfect. So we've got three different uh, ways that um, B cells can be tolerized during development. Um, so those are the three central tolerance mechanisms. So why is that not good enough? What, what parts or what aspect of B cell development means that there still are likely going to be some autoreactive B cells that 
are going to need peripheral tolerance. What's the problem with B-cell development and central tolerance? Yep, Armin. Um, exactly. So in the case of B-cells, all of the testing that we're looking at for self-antigen is happening in the bone marrow. So if an antigen doesn't show up in the bone marrow, it is not an option for testing the B-cell. So there are going to be B-cells that are self-reactive that are going to make it out of the bone marrow because their antigen wasn't present in the bone marrow for testing. So that's one reason why we definitely need peripheral tolerance for B-cells. There's one other reason why peripheral tolerance is really important with B-cells. Um, one other place where we can see some self-reactive B-cells um, cause issues. And those are related to the germinal center reaction that we talked about when we talked about peripheral B-cell responses. So remember that our peripheral B cells undergo this process of somatic hypermutation when they're in the germinal center. They pick up some mutations in the variable region. And the goal, of course, is to add some point mutations to the variable region so that we get stronger binding to antigen, so that the affinity matures for antigen. But this is a, just a Darwinian selection scheme in the lymph node. Those mutations are not actually like directed in any way. They're just some random mutations that that B cell is picking up. And so it is possible that when a B cell undergoes somatic hypermutation and gets that change in its receptor in the germinal center, it might change into a self-reactive B cell. So when we actually pick up some mutations in the germinal center, we might take a B cell that was not previously self-reactive and we might make it self-reactive. So that's another reason why peripheral tolerance mechanisms can be really important for B cells. We also talked about central tolerance in, for T cells. So what do you remember about central tolerance for T cells? Go for it, Ermi. Okay, so one difference is that we have air playing a role. Um, which, what anatomic location are we in now? Um, so thymus. We're in the thymus. We've got this transcription factor air that is making sure that we have all of the possible antigens. So one big difference here is every single antigen is in the thymus for testing. Yay, we don't have that same flaw we had with uh, B cells. Um, what else might sort of goes on in terms of testing in the thymus? Yep, Michael. Uh, we have a positive selection that tests so that the image that the T cell can bind to the T, mm -hmm. and also a negative selection that tests to make sure we don't bind too strongly to anything else. Right. So we've got you know positive selection to make sure we're getting MHC specificity. We've got negative selection to try to basically get do deletion, get rid of those self-reactive cells. Um, any other things happening in the thymus? Yep, Jay. Uh, we have get, like, like you said about the positive, uh, positive selection of the B cells. Mm -hmm. Do you need the B cells to be a little you know, self reactive in order to be going out of the thymus? So, the only things that the T cells can get signals from in the thymus are self antigens. And so in order to be positively selected, every T cell has to be at least a little bit self-reactive. Um, also, remember that one of the outcomes in the thymus is um, making cells into Tregs. So we can also see some cells that come out of the thymus as a Treg. So 
So if we just had central tolerance, we just had the things that we've talked about in terms of central tolerance. Do you think people would have autoimmune diseases or not? Do you think they would be common or rare? Yeah, Michael. Probably pretty common. Probably pretty common. Why? Because um, like the E cells, if they mutate and are done in the normal centers, there's no way to check to see if it's without central tolerance. There's no way to check for E cell and, um, reactive, and then also for T cells. Uh, if it can pass like both selections, uh, there is still a chance that it could be self-reactive in the future. Yeah. So based on what we've thought about tolerance right now. You might ask the question, how in the heck are we all alive? If we all have all these T cells that are self-reactive, we have all these B cells that left our bone marrow not tested against some antigens. We have some B cells that got made self-reactive later. Like, this is a huge problem. You, th this should not work. <laughs> um, and if we look at many of our major autoimmune diseases, you can see that, you know, they're not in 100% of people. They're in 1% or less than 1% of people. And so somehow most of us don't have issues in terms of tolerizing ourselves. So what that should tell you as should the fact that I called this peripheral tolerance, is that there's something besides central tolerance. <laughs> there has to be something else that helps because we just identified a bunch of cracks that cells could slip through. Um, and so what we're going to, we're talking about here is what's going to happen in terms of peripheral tolerance. Basically once that lymphocyte is in a tissue, um, besides bone marrow or thymus. So once that cell has finished development, we also have some additional tolerance mechanisms. Um, your textbook um, has a table uh, that talks about um, the tolerance mechanisms. Um, it kind of smushes some of the ones that I think of separate together. Honestly, like where you make them, where you decide is separate and, and together is a little little squishy, so that's fine. I always learned them as, as there were six mechanisms of central tolerance, or peripheral tolerance. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about the six. Some of them are real, real close together. <laughs> and your textbook doesn't make them as separate things. Um, and what I hope that you will realize today is that you get to see some things that you've already learned and you'll be like, oh wait, I know that, and feel smart. Um, so one of our six mechanisms of peripheral tolerance is a pretty straightforward one. Um, it's clonal deletion. If a cell gets a particular, uh, a particularly strong signal in the periphery, that cell can be deleted. Um, and so it's just sort of a parallel to the deletion process we see in central tolerance. In central tolerance. We're just seeing now peripheral deletion. Um, it's actually a little bit weird and hard to think about how the cell knows it's getting a strong signal that should delete it versus a strong signal that should make it an effector. And to be honest, we don't totally understand, but we do know that sometimes those self-reactive cells are deleted. Um, this may be related to um, the idea of T cell exhaustion. You can imagine that if there's a cell that is seeing self antigen every single day for your whole life, um, that cell may um, be exhausted. That may eventually lead to the cell getting deleted. So this may be kind of uh, long-term detail of exhaustion 
in any case, deletion is a thing, is one of our six mechanisms of peripheral tolerance. The second major mechanism of peripheral tolerance is known as clonal energy. Um, all of the six that I'm going to tell you about could be phrased as clonal something. So the other one was clonal deletion. This one's clonal energy. And this is particularly important as a peripheral tolerance mechanism for T cells. Because recall that T cells need signal one and signal two in order to be activated. And if that T cell does not get uh, signal two upon activation, then we're going to energize that T cell. So if there was no pathogen around, we were not able to um, have a PRR stimulated to make B7, it's probably a self antigen and we're not going to actually stimulate that T cell. Not only are we not gonna stimulate it, we're gonna turn it off. So again, something that you actually already know of, knew about is one of these mechanisms of uh, tolerance. Um, so our third major mechanism of peripheral tolerance is one that when I think of it, I often think of with B cells. So I will admit that when I think about peripheral tolerance um, and I think about energy, I usually am thinking about T cells and signal one and signal two. Because if you think about it, B cells got to do energy in the bone marrow. When we're thinking about the periphery, we're really seeing T cells. The, the next mechanism I'm gonna tell you about in my head is something I always think about with B cells. Could I imagine a way it applied to something other than B cells? Yeah, but it's generally something I think about with B cells. Um, and that is known as clonal helplessness. Remember that in order for a B cell to make a response that includes lots of antibodies, like a plasma cell response, those B cells need T cell help. So if that B cell, where's my cursor? There. If my B cell gets T cell help, it's going to make plasma cells, lots of antibodies, maybe, you know, give me autoimmunity, I'd be sad. But if that same B cell, can't find a T cell in the lymph node or other secondary lymphoid organ, that B cell is not going to get activated, it's not going to get T cell help, and is not going to make this nice T dependent response. And so one of the ways we can imagine we keep this B cell that maybe is self reactive from really being able to make a strong response to self antigen is that we don't ever let it get help. So yeah, our B cell might not have ever been tested in the bone marrow against a protein from the retina. So maybe that that B cell could get activated by that protein from the retina, but the T cell because of air got deleted. We have no T cell because remember T cells get tested against everything. So some of those B cells won't ever get turned on correctly because they're never going to find their matching T cell. They're never going to get T cell help. They're just going to be helpless and be sad. Um, and so that B cell is not going to actually get activated um, because of the lack of help. So again, while you hadn't heard this phrased as a mechanism of tolerance before, it's stuff that you already know. Um, the fourth mechanism of tolerance is clonal suppression. And clonal suppression is a fancy way of saying, have Tregs turn stuff off. 
So we have regulatory T cells that can inhibit the functions of other T cells. And so one of the ways that we might deal with a self-reactive cell in the periphery is that we might turn that self-reactive cell off using Tregs. Um, and you can even imagine other types of immunoregulatory environment like you saw in the mucosal tissue. And that's all kind of getting some kind of coil suppression. Those four of the six are the most straightforward four. Life gets a little more complicated <laughs> with the other two. In the end, the other two are mostly about things you've already heard, but they, we have to think about them a little harder to fully get them. So are there questions about these four? Uh, deletion, energy, helplessness, and suppression. Yeah, Michael. Uh, for deletion, it's basically all just B cells, right? Um, it could be either T B or T cells. It could be either. Okay. Um, so our fifth mechanism of peripheral tolerance is known as clonal deviation. Clonal deviation is really about shifting helper T cell subsets around. So the idea is that perhaps one type of T cell response is going to cause damage. And so instead of making that damaging type of helper T cell, we make a different type. We deviate the cells away from that. If you look in your textbook, your textbook kind of starts to lump this with suppression because one of the ways you can deviate is to make a regulatory cell. Um, but I'm going to kind of think a little bit more about uh, deviation. So this is sort of one example to try to um, help you understand this. So here you can see two mice that are infected with a particular pathogen called Leishmania major. And if you take a mouse, just a standard everyday mouse, which is shown here as a yellow mouse, and you infect that mouse with Leishmania major, the mice are gonna die of this infection. So you can see this is a survival curve. We see the percent of mice surviving at different days. Eventually we get to zero mice surviving because they have died due to this infection. However, um, with lots of immunologic study, um, we have realized why those mice die following the infection with Leishmania major. And what we realized is that those mice are making an immune response that actually destroys their tissues and kills them. And that immune response is a Th2 response. If we have mice and give them Leishmania major, and then we also give them an antibody against IL-4, so that they can't make a Th2 response. We basically block their ability to make a Th2 response. So now you might imagine they maybe they make a Th1 because we've blocked their ability to make Th2. If you actually block that Th2 response, the mice all survive their Leishmania infection. And so the idea here is that your immune response might naturally make a Th1 response when infected with Leishmania and keep you safe. Um, so maybe your immune response normally makes a Th1. Other people's immune responses maybe make a Th2 and they get a worse disease. And you'll see that uh, coming forward as well. Um, we can see this in some other places as well. So here we are looking again at 
um, mice. And on the left, you can see the, what the airway and lung biopsy look like in normal mice. We can also look at mice that are missing TBAT. Mice that are missing TBAT can't make a Th1 response. So they probably make a Th2 response. And you can also see what the, their airway inflammation and what uh, their lungs look like. You can see that they don't look so good. <laughs> um, and if we actually look further, we can see um, a large amount of mucus in the airway. That is mucus that's right that's in this spot. That's where the breathing is supposed to go, the air. You can see it's full of mucus. Kind of hard to breathe when your airway looks like that. Um, as well as all of these different cells coming in as part of inflammation. And so what we realized is just switching the balance between different helper T cell subsets might we be the, is sort of the difference in this case between having a healthy situation and having a pathology type of situation. And so the idea with clonal deviation is that your immune response might push towards a healthy situation and push away from an unhealthy situation. That's what deviation is about. Here we can sort of see a similar example um, of thinking about deviation. So we can see a situation where T cells might get activated in response to a particular antigen. This antigen is an antigen that comes from a type of microbe called a helminth. I don't know if microbe is really the right word. It's a type of organism called a helminth. A helminth is a parasitic worm. Some people, when they get a helminth infection, might make a Th2 type of response. And if they make a Th2 type of response, they're going to get some mucus, they're going to get rid of epithelium, they're going to activate eosinophils, they're going to make some IgE, they're going to kill those parasites. Other people might make a more Th1 related response. And if somebody makes a Th1 related response, they might make IgG antibodies, which are useless against helminths. They also might make a whole lot of interferon gamma, which actually might start to disrupt healthy tissue. And so whether or not your immune response is sort of biased in one of these directions or another, um, whether or not your immune system did sort of, we'll call it the good response of Th2, it, it deviated to Th2 to protect you, or whether you happen to be in the short straw people who got Th1 and be sad, um, will influence whether or not you're going to have disease. This um, set of observations also underlies another area, big area of immunology. So this is going to feel like I'm going on a diversion from peripheral tolerance. Not really, but um, it's something that you got to talk about with immuno when you talk about immunology. Um, and it sort of it starts with us thinking for a second about helminth infection. So you can see here I'm talking about helminth infection. Um, these are uh, some diseases that are caused by helminths. Um, so this includes uh, infections with roundworms, flukes, or tapeworms, um, some of which you may have heard of as ascariasis, draculoniasis, elephantiasis, um, hookworm, uh, schistosomiasis, tapeworm, uh, a whole lot of um, these infections. Um, one that you're going to see on the next slide is um, related to a, a schistosome. Um, and it, you're actually going to see a schistosome larva. 
So typically what you can see here is these are actually all eukaryotic parasites. In most cases, in many cases, they're multicellular parasites. They're big parasites. And here you can see the larva of a schistosome with a whole bunch of eosinophils around it. If you look at this larva compared to our granulocytes, do you think any of those granulocytes are going to be able to phagocytose that larva? So Jay, you're shaking your head no. Why no? I think it's because it's a Yeah, look how big that larva is compared to all those little eosinophils around it. Those eosinophils are not going to phagocytose that larva. And in general, helminths are um, not really things that we're phagocytosing. The way that we deal with helminth infection is by having eosinophils or mast cells release the components of their granules at the larva. Basically, you can imagine it as sort of we're releasing little toxic bombs that are trying to kill this thing. Because we can't eat that. We're going to release some kinds of products that are in our granules in order to kill this larva. Um, some of those products include things like histamine, among uh, some others. So we can also think about how much we are currently at risk of helminth infection. You can think about your daily life and how much, if at all, you have ever thought about getting a helminth. This, whether or not this is something you have really ever worried too much about. If we actually look in the world at where people are infected with helminths, by and large, we tend to see helminth infections in the areas of the world where that are shown here in red. And we see relatively few helminth infections in areas of the world that are shown in blue. OK, sure. Part of that is really due to modern sanitation. So once upon a time in the past with primitive early, I don't know what the right word is right now, past humans, everybody got infected with helminths. In fact, probably past humans, everybody got infected with human helminths like all the time. But now in some places, we don't. We got rid of them. In fact, we are very close to getting rid of a couple of the diseases that are on this slide. Um, they are almost eradicated from the globe um, due to the efforts of someone named William Campbell, who was a former Drew Rise Fellow and won the Nobel Prize. This is what he won the Nobel Prize for, is actually specifically el eliminating some of these. So we have very few helmets. OK, whatever. People have observed, and there are some questions that will that end up getting asked at this point that people want to know answers to and that are we really don't have awesome answers to. So I guarantee you, you may ask me a question that I'm going to be like, mm, we don't know on this front. But people made some epidemiological observations. So they were studying disease patterns, just numbers of people with different disease states. And what they found is shown on the left, which is that in the place where we see autoimmune diseases in the world is basically almost the exact opposite of where we see helminth infection. Like there seems to be this difference between autoimmune disease and helminth infection, as if perhaps getting helminths means you don't get autoimmune disease or something like that. Like there's this um, sort of weird little balance. These types of epidemiological observations led immunologists to propose something called the hygiene hypothesis. I'm going to show you the data on the hygiene hypothesis, or some information about the hygiene hypothesis on the next couple of slides. 
I will also say the hygiene hypothesis is one of those things that sometimes non-immunologists take way too far in crazy ways. So um, I will admit I myself and many people I know have made hygiene hypothesis related jokes and there are plenty of hygiene hypothesis related jokes to be made. Um, however, um, some of the things that people come up with at this, uh, off of this are a little out there. So we're gonna try to not be a little out there. Um, what has been observed is that there are a number of different factors that seem to um, be statistically associated with not having a lot of allergies and autoimmune diseases. Um, so we can see that um, in countries where there are more helminth infections, um, we tend to see fewer allergies and autoimmune diseases, while in the more westernized countries, you, we see uh, more allergy and autoimmune disease. With the idea that perhaps having some exposure to microbes when you are young helps train your immune response and helps you with that clonal deviation process. Um, we can also see that there is a relationship between coming from a larger family and having no allergies as opposed to a smaller family and having allergies. You can imagine if you have a smaller family, your house is probably cleaner. Similarly, um, if you're in a rural home and have livestock, you're less likely to have allergies. Um, and so the idea is, well, maybe if you don't have enough um, of certain types of pathogens during the immune response, your immune system becomes um, particularly poorly able to, uh, do, to deal with some types of infections. Your sort of deviation process is off. And so your immune response ends up getting directed more towards self antigens. Um, there are also, so you can see that um, being around more microbes and having helminth infections um, has been linked towards uh, lack of a number of these disease states. Um, being an only child um, has been linked towards having allergies. Um, also, uh, it seems as though it's actually protective to have older siblings. You can imagine that if you have older siblings, the house is probably not quite as clean. Um, as, as now, all of my friends have little kids who I spend time with. Um, I look at this and I'm like, oh, absolutely. Um, if you go to daycare, um, you tend to have uh, an association with less allergy um, and growing up in sort of farming environments. Um, so we do see all of these associations. I absolutely have been in situations where when I was in graduate school, somebody would like start having an allergic reaction and someone would be like, your mom didn't let you eat enough dirt as a kid. Um, but some of the places where people take this in terms of immunity debt and where what how much is too clean and things like that get a little nutty. <laughs> so this has epidemiologically shown in some pretty extreme situations, particularly with regard to helminth infection. There are some ideas about using some of this specifically in terms of um, exposing individuals to more helminth related antigens. Um, there has been discussion of should we give people uh, dead heat killed schistosome larvae um, so they're exposed to the antigen and sort of bias their immune response in that way. Um, but again, like I said, there are also some ways that this gets taken in a slightly nutty way. So if you've ever heard about like all sorts of things about cleanliness and immune responses, it's actually, come, it's like a someone taking this 27 steps too far. Um, there are also other hypotheses about what's going on with the hygiene hypothesis. Um, one of which is shown here um, and I think that this is also really uh, interesting to think about. If we imagine our population um, as having kind of a distribution of immune responses, so some members of our population have a low immune response, some have a medium immune response, some have a high immune response. The ones who have the high immune response are the ones who are most likely to have autoimmunity because their immune response is really high, right? 
if if all of us are infected with a parasite, as a as a whole, we're all going to get shifted to having a reduced immune response. Our all of our immune systems are going to be lowered. So there aren't going to be very many people who are above the level needed for autoimmunity. If we get rid of all of our parasites, our whole population is going to shift towards having a better immune response, and more people are going to be above that bar um, leading to allergy. And so there's, there's probably quite a bit going on here, but these are all things that come out of us understanding and thinking about clonal deviation. Um, on Wednesday, when I talk about clonal deviation, um, I will be talking about um, some uh, specific examples of a disease that we actually have worked out some of the details about how the deviation gets messed up and thus why people get that particular disease state. And so for some people, hearing about deviation in this way makes perfect sense. And for other people, until they see the example of it getting messed up, it doesn't make any sense. And then they see the example and they're like, oh, that's what she meant. Um, so those are five of our mechanisms of peripheral tolerance. We have one more mechanism of peripheral tolerance to talk about. It is one that is probably the least, I mean, this one you can say it's, it's about like TH1s and TH2s and T cell subsets. This one is probably the one that's, tie, that's like the least obvious in terms of how it ties into other uh, types of things, but it also has some aspects that are really cool. Um, as with some of the others, it is one where our understanding has evolved and is still evolving. So I'm going to tell you the classic way it works. And then I'm going to tell you why that's probably not totally true and how we're still we're kind of rethinking how it works. But usually everybody likes this one. So um, officially, this one could be called clonal ignorance um, if we are using that same nomenclature with starting things with clonal. Um, I often think about this as immune privilege. Sometimes I just talk about it as privilege. And it has to do with certain anatomical organs. And you can see those organs listed here. So I want you to take a look at those organs. And I want you to tell me what those organs have in common. Do not overthink it. <laughs> People usually try to go for stuff that's much more complicated here than is actually what we're looking for. How would you do in terms of surviving and reproducing if any of those organs got damaged? Not great. Huh? Not great. Not great. And if you damaged any of those organs, surviving and reproducing is kind of like out the window. So these are some organs that really need to be protected. Because if these are not protected, you're kind of done for in terms of survival and reproduction. And so what it seems as uh, though happens with these organs is that we actually, and this is the classic definition, we completely exclude the immune system from these organs. We say, lymphocytes, we're not gonna let you go there because the possibility of you making a response and killing self cells here is too great. If, we, if you did something wrong in this area, T cells, if you killed a cell you weren't supposed to kill, T cells, it would be a catastrophe. So the idea is that we basically hide these organs from the immune system. The very classic 
example of this is a disease called sympathetic ophthalmia. And sympathetic ophthalmia has to do with immune privilege in the eye. The idea with sympathetic ophthalmia and immune privilege in the eye is that the eye is, as I said, kind of hidden from the immune system. The, you're, we basically don't have any lymphocytes going to the eye. You can think about this as an issue with trafficking, an issue of anatomical barriers that keeps those antigens away from any particular T cells. In sympathetic ophthalmia, sometimes we have a situation, oh, I lost my cursor again, um, where we have damage to one eye. So here you can see an eye getting damaged, perhaps because someone, I don't know, got stabbed in the eye or something. That could break that barrier that was keeping those antigens hidden and keeping those antigens from the immune system. Those antigens now can go to the local lymph node and turn on T cells. And T cells will be like, whoa, what are these antigens? Look at all of this foreign stuff I've never seen before. Oh my goodness. And those T cells will then traffic to try to kill anything with that antigen. And in fact, the T cells will lead to the destruction of both eyes, not just the, ones that, that the one that was stabbed. The other one now will get destroyed as well because suddenly the hidden antigens were shown to the immune system. The immune response freaked out and went to destroy those other cells. And so here you can see there was trauma to one eye and yet the patient ends up going blind in both eyes. This is actually how Louis Braille went blind. So if you want a random history fact of the day with the Braille language system, was made by Louis Braille, this is how Louis Braille went blind. Yes? Um, sorry, I was confused. So it would only happen, it would always happen if you have damage to your eye? So it, it does not seem to always happen, it, but it has to be kind of pretty severe damage that allows antigens le to leak out of the barrier. And this is, again, I, I, I am not sure I've ever heard a discussion of immune privilege where sympathetic ophthalmia doesn't come up. It's like the, all, the example everyone always uses. Um, one thing I will also just point out that is Actually, I don't like the next slide. I think the next slide is a slide that should be t on Wednesday and not today, so I'm skipping it. So if you hear about this scheme, so the classic immune privilege, sympathetic ophthalmia, Louis Braille scheme, where we take these organs and we actually keep out lymphocytes. We t say that we cannot have any lymphocytes in those organs. Can you imagine any ways that that could be a problem? No big immune response in these organs. Could that be not good? Yeah, Michael. If you do get an infection in these areas, there's no way to fight it. Okay, what were you gonna say, Carmen? I was gonna say um, that these are for example, like your uterus or your brain, like those are big organs that, like, um, those are big organs basically. So if you do have an infection or you're not able to fight it, it could spread quicker. Well, or it could destroy the important organs. Yeah. These are the important organs we don't want to destroy. Yeah. So we're going to not protect them? Like, it seems a little wonky, right? Yeah. Um, so just to give you one sort of place where our knowledge on this has been uh, changing around a little bit. I have to tell you a couple things about Ebola. So this is uh, from a publication from 2007. And it shows all of the known Ebola epidemics before that time. It shows both the, in the darker color, 
the number of people who died in that Ebola epidemic. In the lighter color, the number of people who were infected. And you can see the actual numbers at the top of the bars. You don't need to worry about the colors or any of that, like the red versus yellow. Not important for what we're talking about here. So what you can see is in these data, the biggest ever Ebola outbreak was 425 people. There were a couple 300s as well. And you can see that in every outbreak, the majority of people who had Ebola died of their Ebola infection. A relatively small proportion lived. This is really different than the situation that we are in now. This is the 2014 Ebola epidemic. In 2014, remember how in the previous slide, the biggest ever Ebola epidemic was 425? 2014 was 30,000 instead of 425. And only about a third of those infected died. So there are all these people who survived Ebola who are now present in the world that we never had before. And they keep having weird symptoms. There were sort of rumors, little stories here and there that people who lived through Ebola had weird stuff happen to them. But there were never that many people, so you couldn't really ever say it was a thing. But now there's so many of them. Let me tell you about some of the things that seems to happen to Ebola survivors. Um, sometimes they seem to have weird eye symptoms. And so this is a uh, sort of one of the first sort of famous cases where this doctor got, uh, was working in Liberia um, and suddenly um, had his eye change color um, and actually started to have um, vision issues because it turned out that even though the virus was cleared from the rest of his body, even though the rest of his body got rid of the virus, it stuck around in his eye. So you can see that this sort of idea of the immune privilege does have this potentially bad outcome of maybe not protecting you so well in some of these organs. If we actually look at some of these other patients, um, so these, this is a report for, about this paper, you can see that others have joint and muscle pain, vision and hearing loss, psychological problems, um, eye problems, loss of hearing, sleep difficulty, memory issues, uh, headaches, all things that are largely related to brain and eye symptoms. Um, and so perhaps immune privilege is leading to a little bit more of an issue here. When we looked even further, or when further investigation was done, we have realized that Ebola virus can actually persist in the testes for over a year. I can't remember what the current record number is. Um, so we've actually been able to see people who were basically Ebola free or countries that were Ebola free suddenly have infections start again because of sexual transmission from a survivor when that survivor had virus persisting for months to years in that patient. So to the point where there were countries where there were no cases, no cases, no cases, no cases, no cases, it's totally gone. To, oh wait, there are cases again that we could actually track back to sexual transmission. This woman, Pauline Cafferkey, um, is a nurse um, who was working in, uh, she's a Scottish nurse who's working in Liberia. She ended up um, being positive three times um, because the virus seemed to be in immune privilege sites and ke keep coming back out um, in her case. And there are a number of sort of cases that they're rare, but um, as we now seem to have this huge number of Ebola survivors, we're now tracking more and more cases of Ebola sort of hiding out in immune privilege sites and coming back later. And what exactly that means and how that works is not totally clear, 
But it does make you think that maybe you don't like this whole immune privilege thing. <laughs> Makes It shows you one little caveat to this immune privilege thing. Yep? And there's no way to kind of, um, like, not fix that, but like temporarily help with that thing? Um, these are all cases that we are just, that we have seen within the past five years or so. So we didn't know it, yeah, we didn't know they existed until more recently. And so in the, we, there are hypotheses about what to do and there are things people are trying, mm -hmm. um, but there isn't kind of a overall literature of what to do um, because of how soon it has been. Um, but there is one other piece about immune privilege that we should talk about in terms of um, kind of our understanding and the fact that the way that the classic Louis Braille sympathetic ophthalmia might not be exactly how it really works. Um, this case is related to a particular autoimmune disease called multiple sclerosis. And so in thinking about how this case works, um, we can talk a little bit about multiple sclerosis. So normally, neurons look something like this that you see on the bottom, where we have this thing called a myelin sheath that is coating the neuron. Um, it's, uh, it's basically like a lipid. And you can think of it as being like the plastic on the outside of a wire. It helps to make sure the electrical current goes in the correct direction down the neuron. What happens if you pull some of, have some spots on your uh, wires that don't have plastic on them? Yeah. You get shocks. Sometimes you get shorts in the circuit. The, the electricity tries to go out instead of going along the current. If we have this myelin sheath um, start to get degraded, it's the same kind of problem. The electrical impulse that's involved in um, neural signaling isn't going to go down the neuron. It's going to go in the wrong places. And so we're not going to get normal nerve transmission. That can come up in a number of different symptoms that will happen, but the idea is we don't get normal transmission um, down those nerves because of that myelin sheath getting destroyed. And that's what multiple sclerosis is, is a disease state where that myelin sheath is getting destroyed by immune responses. Um, there is a lot um, that we will see that is known versus unknown in terms of multiple sclerosis next time. But one of the things that we do know about multiple sclerosis is that um, in multiple sclerosis, there are T cells that actually go into the brain and specifically are killing the cells who make the myelin or are destroying the myelin itself. So we've got T cells in the brain causing some destruction. You can see there, yes, there are other things like antibodies and whatnot here too, but the answer is, we've always talked about, it's these T cells that go to the brain and destroy either the myelin itself or the myelinating cells. So, based on what you know, could you propose a way to treat or stop multiple sclerosis? What seems wrong with multiple sclerosis compared to the rest of this lecture, or what we've just been talking about, and what might you want to try to do? There, I helped. Yeah, Brianna. So the problem is that somehow T cells are going to this immune privileged site. 
And if we could just block the T cells from going to the brain, we could all live happily ever after, right? Do you know anything about how T cells go to specific sites? Any kinds of proteins you know about with that? Yeah, Michael. It's like trafficking proteins. Trafficking proteins. So remember, like there were selectins and chemokines and integrins. So people realized that there was a particular integrin that was important for helping these cells go to the brain called alpha-4 beta-1. And they made a drug that was just an antibody against alpha-4 beta-1 that could block that integrin so that the cells could no longer make it into the brain. And so the idea was to treat people with this antibody. Now their T cells can no longer go to the brain. So now the T cells are not going to cause problems. Um, this drug was called Tisabri, is called Tisabri. Um, and here on the uh, right, you can see a graph of time on the x-axis and number of lesions in MS patients on the y-axis. You can see that the patients typically are getting uh, many new lesions in their brains over time. And when those patients were treated with this antibody that blocked T cell trafficking to the brain, then it was sort of this revolutionary treatment for multiple sclerosis. Um, you know, it really, really blocked the T cells going to the brain for multiple sclerosis. However, problems started to happen pretty soon after all of this. Um, there started to be some patients with something called PML who were getting treated with Tisabri. And PML, it turns out, is a situation where there is a virus in the brain that is causing some damage. And the virus, in this case, it's called JC virus, um, is actually infecting most, in fact, most people. But if you, and so normally, it turns out the T cells were supposed to go to the brain to kill the virus. Now, if we block T cells from going to the brain, we can't kill the virus anymore, and suddenly our patients don't have MS anymore, but they do start to have this viral infection of the brain, progressive multifocal loop encephalopathy. Um, and this started to tell us, oh, so our original idea that it was just about the cells don't go to the brain and that makes it all better, our, that sympathetic ophthalmia or any part of immune privilege is you just, the cells never go there, can't really be right, because here, we make the cells not go to the brain. We think we've restored the immune privilege and we're all good. And we see disaster strikes. Those T cells do need to go to the brain. If the T cells can't go to the brain, bad stuff happens. And we realize that some of this is probably also related to things like um, maybe having more T regs in those areas or more suppressive cytokines. Um, it may not be the simple, you keep it all out with a wall that we originally thought it was. Um, so next time we're going to be thinking about um, autoimmunity and how it results from a failure of self tolerance. And we're going to sort of come back to, you know, how frequent autoimmune diseases are and think about, okay, so if we have all these mechanisms of central tolerance and all these mechanisms of peripheral tolerance, how the heck does anyone have an autoimmune disease? How does anything how, does they, how, does, how do all of these things, one after the other after the other, all of these protections go wrong to potentially lead to autoimmunity? And so we're going to talk about how tolerance fails uh, next time.